instead of <clears throat> going through it little bit by little bit, I just want to read the whole thing and then come back and uh, go through it that way. So uh, if you want to turn to Genesis chapter 28, we're going to begin in verse 10. Uh, it says, Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, <clears throat> and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Now remember that, the angels of God ascending and descending on this ladder. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set up for it a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give a tenth to you. Several, I don't know, probably a couple years ago, uh, Rose and I were having a conversation. I don't remember if the girls had asked us about this or if it's just one of those silly conversations you have as a married couple. Uh, But we were discussing how the other one would feel or, or what would we be okay with if one of us passed away, the other getting remarried. Um... And, you know, my, <laughs> my immediate response to that was, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to be dead. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't care, obviously, because I wouldn't be there to care about it. Uh, but my second thought to that was, you know, as long as that was a biblical and godly, um, I want Rose to be happy. As much as a person deserves to be happy, whatever that means, uh, Rose deserves to be happy. So I want Rose to be happy. Well, well, not too long after that conversation, I had a dream where I had passed away and, and Rose had remarried. And I woke up in the morning, you know, and after seeing Rose married to another man, and I was shocked at uh, just how little I actually care about Rose's happiness. Um, <laughs> because in, in that particular instance, I don't want her to be happy. I'm just, I'm not going to lie. I don't want to see that, right? So dreams, uh, w- there's no real explanation for the purpose of dreams. There's a, a bunch of disagreeing about what they're for, but the, the, the consensus, the main theory is that dreams help us understand our emotions and help us process the realities of our life. So things we've experienced or things we're worried about, things that are going to happen to us, we dream about those things to help us process and understand those things. And clearly, uh, the emotions that I thought I had about her happiness, uh, there were some other emotions lying under there that dream helped me process and understand about myself. Here we are, Jacob has this dream. We encounters God. Heaven meets earth. And if ever a guy needed to process some things that had happened in his life, or to understand some emotions, it was Jacob. Because Jacob is is running at this moment like a fugitive. Jacob is running pathetic and cowardly away from his family. And this is one of those stories, Jacob's Ladder, that we teach to our children. And, you know, it's such a great thing that God comes and meets his people. We we teach this story as sort of a, a, a joyous thing, and we've even written songs about climbing Jacob's ladder and it's sort of a happy clappy moment but this story doesn't start off that way this story is not a happy clappy Jacob is is a scoundrel and he's evil and this this part of the story can't be divorced from what we've already read 
I want to turn back to Genesis chapter 27 for just a minute because this is not all Jacob. Jacob's got a co-conspirator in this. He's deceived his father and he's stolen from his brother and left victims in his wake. But go to Genesis chapter 27. Let's look at verses 43 and 45. Jacob's not totally alone in this. This is his mother's plan. It says, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise, free to Laban my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why, why should I be bereft of both of you in one day? So here's Rebecca, Jacob's mother. Remember, Jacob is Rebecca's favorite. And Rebecca's got this plan to send Jacob away to her, to her brother Laban so that he might get away from Esau's anger. And she says, go there for a while. Okay? And that word a while, it's, it's the same word that's later translated. You'll remember in a few, uh, few chapters we'll get to Jacob marrying uh, Rachel. And remember, Jacob gets to Laban and Laban says, yeah, you, you work for seven years and I'll give you my daughter. But then he gives, her, gives him uh, Leah, not the daughter that he wants. And he makes him work, work another seven years to get Rachel. And remember, the Bible says that those seven years that he worked for Rachel seemed but a few days because of the love that he had for her. That word that we translate but a few days is the same word that's here in chapter 27 where Rebecca says, go for a while. Rebecca's plan is that Isaac, I mean Jacob, is going to go to her brother for just a short period of time, maybe just a few days, which is on its face is stupid, right? Jacob has just stolen everything from his brother. And probably most of us know families, or maybe we're even part of a family, in which inheritances or blessing or material goods have been fought over. Those, those pains, those brokenness, those, those fractures in relationships don't go away in a few days. In fact, sometimes those things never go away. So this plan just on its face is stupid, that he would just be gone in just a few days. But that's the plan. Uh, but even more than that, it's just a total miscalculation. Jacob won't be gone just a few days. He's going to be gone 20 years. Okay? And then she also says, when it's time, I'll send someone to come and get you so that you'll know you can come back. Well, guess what? We're going to find out in the rest of the story that never happens. And the reason why that never happens is most scholars believe that Rebecca dies during this time that Jacob is away. So this mother, who has favored this son this whole time, plotting, scheming, Mother, all her, son, all her sin has gotten her is the chance to never see her beloved son again. Rebecca has no clue what she's doing. And Jacob is just as bad and probably worse because at least Rebecca had a plan. Jacob has no plan. All he knows is, I'm going north. I'm going to Haran. That's 500 miles away from where he is. So he knows he's going there. But the 500 miles in between, and let's, I mean, that's, that's a lot of miles if you're walking, okay? That's a lot of miles if you're walking through desert. That's not a couple days journey. The 500 miles in between, he has zero plan. And we look at verse 10. Let's go back to chapter 28 and look at verses 10 and 11. It says, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran, verse 11, and he came to a certain place and he stayed there that night because the sun had set. Do you see what Jacob's plan is? I'm just going to go until the sun stops. When the sun goes down, I'll lay down. Jacob, Jacob has not thought this out at all. Jacob stopped in this place that night because the sun went down. And the beginning of that verse, verse 11, says he came to a place. Did that word he came, it means he happened upon. It's translated that way uh, in, in not the ESV, other translations, and elsewhere in the Old Testament. That word means he happened upon it meaning he came upon it by accident. There was no plan here. There was no purposefulness here. Jacob has no idea what's going on. He's just wandering aimlessly as a fugitive, as someone who's left victims in his wake, and he stops because the sun goes down. And remember, as we, we talked about a few weeks ago, this isn't a 17-year-old boy. This isn't a 17-year-old boy whose brain's not fully developed, who's made dumb decisions as 17-year-old boys tend to do. This is a 70-ish year old man who's wandering aimlessly, just doing whatever mommy tells him to do. This story, as to this point, is really sad uh, and, and pathetic on Rebecca and Jacob's 
part. And then beyond that, just beyond the no purpose, no plan, not thinking this thing out, there's a much deeper spiritual thing going on here. Again, let's go back to verse 10. It says, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. Now, unless you're, uh, you know, super good with biblical maps, which I'm not, I doubt many of us are, or unless you've read through Genesis and taken really good notes, um, which, which I haven't, and I doubt many of us, many of us have, Chat, our verse 10 is a verse that we read just pretty much as a matter of fact, a statement of fact, that Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran. He's traveling south to north. But there's something much worse, much, much deeper going on here. You remember Genesis chapter 12, God comes to Abraham, named Abram at that point. And he makes Abram a promise, three promises actually. He says, Abram, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm, you and your descendants will be a great nation. I'm going to give you and your descendants a place to live. And I'm going to make you and your descendants a blessing to all the people of the earth. That sounds like a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful promise from God to this man, Abram. But God requires something of Abram. He says, you're going to have to leave your land. You can't stay where you are. And so he says, you're going to go down into the land that I'm promising to give your people, the land that will be your people's at some point. That's where you must go. So where Abraham goes is down south. And where Abraham actually ends up is basically where Jacob is running away from. Jacob is running away from Beersheba. Jacob is running away from the promise of God. And where is he going? To Haran. And where was Haran? The place where Abram was that God told him to get out of there. Now, it's impossible to undo the things that God is doing. But if a person could undo what God is doing, that's what Jacob would be doing here. So I just want to see that this picture that God has painted for us uh, of Jacob and Rebekah, but specifically Jacob, it's just there's nothing good going on here. And again, for a 70-year-old man, uh, you would think there's, there's got to be some goodness, some highlight in his life. But God's chosen. We're not talking about that. All I'm showing you is the deceitfulness and the scheming and the pride and the arrogance of Jacob because I want to show you what I do in the lives of people. And so what we see here is this should have been the greatest time in Jacob's life. Because he's got all the material blessing, not all of it, but two-thirds of it. He's got everything he could ever want. God is with him. He's blessed his grandfather and his father. And now Jacob has that material blessing, the birthright. And he's got the blessing. He's, so he's got the spiritual blessing as well. He's got the privilege. He's got the promise of prosperity. This should be the greatest time of Jacob's life. But because of his sin, it's the lowest time of his life. Because of his sin, his life is marked with shame and fear. In isolation. The, nothing is going right for him. He's not seeking the Lord when he has this encounter with God. In fact, Jacob has mentioned God's name one time in this story, and that was to tell a lie. That was to convince his dad that something that he was saying that was untrue was true. He's only used God's name in vain. He's not seeking God. Jacob could not be less worthy of an encounter with the Lord in Genesis chapter 28. And so here he is stopping for the night. And as far as he knows, on this particular night, he is in no particular place. But let's look at verse 11 one more time. It says, and he came, he happened upon, as we saw, he happened upon a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Now, in that Hebrew, if we were reading this in Hebrew, we would see a definitive article there. It says, Jacob happened upon not a place. Jacob happened upon the place. And the point is this. Jacob, in all his sinfulness, and is running like a, a pathetic, cowardly fugitive, because that's what he is, has no plan. Jacob has no idea what's going on. But God does. And Jacob had come to not a place. Jacob had come to the place. And it's in this place, the place, where God burst into Jacob's life with the full force of his mercy and grace. And he's going to renew the promise that he gave to Abram with Jacob to the lowliest and the least deserving. So suddenly this ladder appears, and it's probably more likely that this is a staircase, um, 
We know from just the etymology of that word uh, that it's probably a staircase. Um, uh, we've always just translated it ladder, and so you'll see that in your translations, ladder. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but there was temples where Jacob lived in the ancient Near East called ziggurats. I think we've got a picture of that. Um, ziggurats were these square buildings, rectangular buildings, one on top of another. Temples just like that. And as you can see, there were staircases, went up the side to the top. And the point of that was when you came to worship in that place, you would ascend that staircase, you would get to the top of the temple, and there you would meet your God. And so Jacob was familiar with that. Jacob had seen staircases that all the people around him were telling him led to some God, one God or another. But there's two very important differences between the staircases on the ziggurat and the staircase that God makes that night or the ladder, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. Two important differences. And one is God's ladder, Jacob's ladder, is built by the hands of God, not by the hands of man. The ladder's not there because of human effort. That ladder's not there because Jacob merited it in his life and his doing and the person that he was. In fact, the exact opposite. That ladder's there because God is bound by God. God is bound to his word. So God in his character and his nature, because he's bound to that, loves the lowliest. And Jacob is the lowliest. Jacob is the least deserving. God's ladder is there because of God's initiative and God's own doing. And the second difference, the second significant difference is that Jacob doesn't have to ascend the ladder to meet God. Nowhere in this story do you see Jacob climbing this ladder. Jacob stays right where he is and he meets God. And I want you to look at verse 13. It says, this says, behold, the Lord stood above it, referring to the ladder. The Lord stood above it. That word above it's also, it's also uh, translated all over in the Old Testament, beside. It's the exact same word. And you can decide what you want to. You can take it forever you want to. You can say God is above this, God is beside it. It doesn't matter. But I would, I would uh, turn your attention to verse 16. It says, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Beside fits better with the Lord is in this place. When Jacob wakes up, he makes an altar on the earth. When Jacob wakes up, he calls a patch of earth Bethel, the house of God. Not some place above him, the very place in which he's standing. Verse 16 would make me think that what, what God was actually doing is not standing above the ladder, was standing beside it. Now, you can take that for wherever you want to. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to say God came down in Genesis chapter 28, we'll get to that in a minute. But the point is this. That if, if none human effort gets you to God, and every other God, every other people group around Jacob, what they believed was, and also to this day, every other religion, what they believe is your effort and your merit bring you into the presence of a God. There is one God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of Jacob, the God of the church, the God of Parkview Christian Church, the God of you, who you come into his presence because of his love and his grace and his mercy and his doing. Nothing to do with you. One God, the God of Israel, the God of Jacob. And so that's a significant difference and that's exactly what God does is he comes to be with Jacob and he renews this promise. But he actually extends it. He doesn't just say, I'm gonna make you a, a, a big family. I'm, I'm gonna give you a land and I'm, I'm gonna have you bless all the people of the earth. He does say that. But he also says, Jacob, I'm going to do more for you than I said I would do for Abraham. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to sustain you. And I'm going to bring you back to your father's house. God extends the promise to the lowliest and the most undeserving. So that's the setup. What's the point of all this? What does this have to do with me? Many of you, or some of you, are probably familiar with the name Adolf Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann, if you're not familiar, uh, is one of the architects of the Jewish Holocaust. Uh, one of, one of the, 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 the people that is most responsible for that atrocity. Uh, and Adolf Eichmann, after the war, was put on trial. And one of the people that was brought to his trial to testify against him was a survivor in Auschwitz named Yehiel de Neur. And as Yehiel de Neur enters that courtroom... He sees Adolf Eichmann for the first time. He's walking up to the witness stand and he, he just looks into the eyes of Adolf Eichmann and he begins to wail. And when I mean wail, I mean wail. Like weeping, yelling, 
sorrow, crying out, and then he faints. He loses consciousness. Some years later, he was interviewed by Mike Wallace. Some of you remember Mike Wallace. He's interviewed by Mike Wallace, and Mike Wallace asked him about that moment specifically. Why did you faint? Was looking at his face so bad that it, did it bring up the trauma? Did it, did it put you back at Auschwitz? Did it, did it make you relive those moments? Is Adolf Eichmann a madman? Is, is Adolf Eichmann a monster? And Yehiel de Noor said this. He said, for the first time when I looked at him, I saw him exactly for what he was, an ordinary man. And then he said, in what has got to be one of the greatest moments of self-analysis in the history of ever, he said, when I saw him, I became afraid for myself. I knew that what he was capable of I was capable of. I, this is a quote, I am exactly like he. Now, we have a tendency, and I think part of it is probably just the nature of being an American because we kick butt and take names and we're, we're right most of the time and we, we're, we're good guys and we're always fighting the bad guys. That's kind of what we've been told. We have, a, we have a tendency, I think, to have a little bit of a historical arrogance and to think if I was in that place, I would have been one of the handful of the righteous and not the masses of the evil. I would have been different. Yehiel de Neur knew that was not true. He knew he could have very easily been the evil. And I wonder if, if we don't come to the text sometimes and treat it exactly the same and go to the cross and say, man, I'd be John or I'd be Mary and not the masses yelling crucify. We come to David and Goliath. We say, man, if I just have faith, I could conquer my giants. I could be like David. Forgetting that we're not David, we're Israel, cowering in fear of Goliath, in need of a savior, in need of deliverance. We're not David, we're Israel. And I wonder if we don't come to a text this morning And forget to identify ourselves with Jacob. You and I are Jacob. There's no difference. And in fact, we might, you know, Hill De Niro said, I am exactly like he. We, We are not only like Jacob, we are Jacob. We don't just have the capacity to do the evil things that Jacob has done. We've done them. We're not exactly like him. We are exactly him. We are Jacob. And all of us are in this place, uh, in in this place of needing to come into the presence of God. We're all on this path uh, of needing to encounter the living God, even though nothing in us merits that encounter. Even nothing in us merits coming into his presence. But we don't have the encounter because we're worthy of it. And like Jacob, we don't have the encounter because we're even looking for it. We have the encounter, we come into the presence of the living God because God breaks into the lives of unsuspecting and undeserving Jacobs because God loves Jacobs. God loves Jacobs. So again, you might say, well, what does that have to do with me? Because I've already had my encounter moment. Some of us have not had that encounter moment and and we desperately need to come to God. We need to come to Jesus Christ. Some of us have had it. What does this have to do with me? I've already had my moment. I've already had that moment. I could point to it. I could tell you uh, about that, that day when I was nine years old in liberal Kansas when I realized I was a sinner in the need of grace of God and I came to Jesus Christ. I can point to it. I can point to my Bethel moment, my house of God moment. You can do the same. You can tell me about the place and time you came to Jesus Christ. What does this have to do with me? Well, let's read verses 20 and 22 again. After all of this, after Jacob's encounter with God, look what Jacob does. Then Jacob made a vow to God saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. 
And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. If God will do this, if, Jacob, Jacob, you just saw heaven open. And you saw God unite heaven and earth. And you're not willing just to say, okay, I'll go with you, God. You don't have to prove a thing to me anymore. You've created me and given me life. And now you've shown up in this place and met me in this place. But you've still got to prove yourself to me. If things go my way, God, I'll follow you. If then. See, Jacob had come to the place. But Jacob hadn't arrived. And we're going to see the rest of this story. Jacob's got a long way to go physically. He's not even close to Haran. He's got to get to Haran and he's got to come back. Jacob's not close physically to where he's going. But Jacob's not close spiritually either. And even though he had had this Bethel moment, house of God moment, the encounter with God moment, Jacob's got a long way to go with God. And if you're in Christ today, you got a long way to go with God too. And I've got a long way to go with God. Last Sunday, we were, um, we were on the road to uh, Florida, and we were, we were in Alabama. And there's, there's, if you're familiar, there's a Bucky's. Don't. We stopped at three of those for some reason. There's a Bucky's. So that's, uh, that's going to make the exit off the highway fairly busy. It's also the exit to Orange Beach and Gulf Shores. So, I mean, this exit is just crowded. I mean, everyone's there, right? So like any good red blood American would, I pulled over into the right lane. And I just got in line and waited my turn to turn right on that intersection, right? But then what happens? All these selfish, dirty, no good sinners pull in the left lane and they start driving past us like they're just better than the rest of us, just waiting to cut off every single person in that line because they're better than them. And inside, shut up, Matt. Inside, <clears throat> I'm boiling, right? I mean, I, I'm trying to be cool outside because I'm trying to be a decent person in front of my wife. But I, inside, it just, just irritates me to no end. And I don't want to see those people do harm, but a flat tire would be all right, okay? <laughs> but then the Holy Spirit convicted me because this is literally at the end of Amos' sermon. We're listening to the sermon. At the end of the sermon, when he's talking about with the same mercy you give is the same mercy you receive. And I can't show mercy to people who haven't even done anything wrong to me. It's actually not wrong, is it, Matt, to get in the left lane and pass all those people? It's not a sin. It's not against the law. And I can't stand them. <laughs> all right? And so the Holy Spirit convicted me in that moment. And, you know, and I said, Joseph, you're an idiot. Later that week, we're standing in line. Uh, the girls are going to get some jet skis. And they, he looks at their um, licenses and says, are you guys OU fans? We said, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so then from behind us, this, we, we hear this voice. And the guy's like, y'all, ain't, you ain't seen nothing yet. You come down to this conference. That's like my best Louisiana redneck voice. <laughs> you come down to this conference and we're going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And like in my mind, I'm like, Ugh, you know. <laughs> Don't, don't say anything, don't say anything. And I just get past it. And then he starts running his mouth again. I'm like, don't tell him about the seven national champions we won. Don't tell him about the 167 All-Americans we have. Don't tell him about the 50 national com- or conference championships we got. Like, don't tell him all this stuff. And then again, the Holy Spirit's like, what are you talking about? And I'm Joseph, to myself, you're an idiot. First of all, what's all the we stuff? You had nothing to do with any of that. Okay? But why are you letting this bother you? Why are you responding to some guy because he said something about a team you like? And in the grand scheme of things, getting a little rankled inside about traffic or because someone said something about your sports team is pretty benign. It's not really that big of a deal until you really pay attention because what's underneath that is, is not really benign. It's a man who lacks gentleness. It's a man who lacks patience. It's a man who's got a pride issue. Who doesn't want to be offended. None of that's benign. It's all cancer and it's all spiritual death. 
Man, I need the grace of God every day. I need the grace of God every day. I need to encounter God daily. And I love what the songwriter said. I need you, oh, I need you every hour I need you. Isn't that something? Encountering God daily is far too infrequent. I need God every hour. I need him in traffic, and I need him in in lines with goofy people, and I need him when I'm talking to my kids and my wife, and I need him when I'm writing a sermon, and you need him when you're at work or when you're loving your spouse. You need him when you lay your head down and when you rise up. You need God's grace. We need to encounter the living God constantly and consistently. Every day is not enough. So how do I meet him? How do I meet this living God? Well, it's, it's an amazing thing, but this story, Jacob's Ladder, it's never mentioned again in the Old Testament. And again, I just point out to you that this is God who is after Genesis. He refers to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the three, but never, never Abraham or Isaac individually. But he does repeatedly refer to himself as I am the God of Jacob alone. He, he invokes Jacob's name. I'm Jacob's God. He's saying, I'm your God, Israel. And for some reason, Israel, the people that call themselves by Jacob's name, never mention this story again. This story where God unites heaven and earth. It's never again in the Old Testament. Never mentioned again in Scripture until it is. And one day there's this, there's this rabbi, wandering rabbi, and he's walking around and he's calling out disciples to himself. And he comes up to this man named Philip. And he says, Philip, follow me. And Philip is willing to follow him. But he says, but first I, I want to go tell my friend. And so he runs off to tell his friend Nathaniel. And he runs to Nathaniel, who's far off, by the way. This rabbi's never seen Nathaniel, at least not, not, not physically seen him, okay? Philip tells Nathaniel, he says, I, I found the guy. I found Messiah, He's from Nazareth. And Nathanael says, Nazareth? What good can come out of Nazareth? So Philip, in one of the great lines of all the Bible, says, come and see. So Philip takes Nathanael to see this rabbi. And as Nathanael is approaching, the rabbi says, here is one, an Israelite, speaking of Nathanael, here's an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And now Nathanael thinks to himself, well, how can this man know about me? He's never seen me. He doesn't know me. And the rabbi says to him, Nathanael, Before Philip called you, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. And Nathanael knows immediately there is something extraordinary that can come out of Nazareth. And he says, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. And the rabbi, Jesus, says, Nathanael, you believed because I told you I saw you under a fig tree. But greater things than these will you to see. Heaven will open up and you will see angels ascending and descending on the son of man it's never mentioned again until jesus comes and jesus is talking about this story and what he's saying is i am the ladder i'm the staircase i'm the one who unites heaven and earth i bridge the gap between god and man and if you're a jacob in need of an encounter with god that comes in one way through me no one comes to the father except through me. So Jacob's need and need of God's mercy and grace run to Jesus. They run to Jesus in their prayers. They run to Jesus through his word. And they run to Jesus in their Christ-like acts of service. But if you're a Jacob in need of God's grace and mercy, which you are and I am, you gotta run to Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you for all your kindness and all your faithfulness. God, we couldn't, these, these, looking at your word would be of no value if it wasn't for Jesus, God. And so we thank you that you sent your son. We thank you that we can come to you and have an encounter with you. And we thank you that even though we have a need for you, a desperate need for you, that that need can be met easily through your son, Jesus Christ. And so I pray now for this church. I pray now for everyone sitting in this room. 
that if they've never come to you, Father, that you would draw them now, that you would move in your Holy Spirit in them and draw them to your Son. But I pray for all the rest of us as well, Father, the ones of us who you have drawn, and we've responded not because of anything we've done, simply by your grace. It was a gift. I pray, God, that you would, in your spirit, make us desperate for Jesus. Not just on Sunday mornings, God. Not on Wednesday nights. Not when we're doing our Bible study at home. But all the time. Make us desperate for your son so that we might have an encounter with you. And we might say, surely God was in this place. And unlike Jacob, We won't have to say, and I didn't know it. It's one of the most heartbreaking things in Scripture. He didn't know it. God, we want to experience you. We want to know you. We want to know you're here. So draw us to you and draw us to your son. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.